What's the word, family? In today's video, we're gonna talk a little bit about one of my top things that I wish that I knew before I started producing music, specifically before I started to buy gear. Let's get into it. One of the traps that most people fall into when they're first starting to get involved with music production is that they're either going to overspend on gear that they really don't need, or they might underspend with the understanding that I'll just use what I have now, which is fine if that's all you can afford. All right, so the first thing is the elephant in the room is gonna be the RAM. Most people will tell you just use what you have, which in the nine times out of 10 is the correct answer. However, for the other percent of people that actually have a little bit of budget or wiggle room to go out and spend a little bit more money, the biggest thing that we don't focus on is the RAM. I didn't have the best understanding of how much RAM that I realistically needed to have in order to run my program, and not even just that, to run my VSTs. As I started to get into production music and making music for film and TV and all these other different things that I make music for, I started to use more and more RAM and needed more and more RAM. Most dolls at a minimum will require at least four to eight gigabytes of RAM. So again, in 2023, most computers should at least have, I would say at least six gigabytes of RAM. But what you wanna make sure that you have is, and my recommendation is at least 16 gigabytes of RAM. Here's why. So the reason why you want a lot of RAM is that if you're running multiple instances of any VST, the more of those instances that you start to pull up, the more your computer is gonna be taxed and the more power is gonna to need to actually run those resources. Have you ever been in a session and you start to pull up more VSTs and more sounds and more plugins and it start, you start to get that crackling? That's because your CPU was being taxed and it's reaching its limit. So that's the biggest thing that I would say right out the gate is making sure that your computer is strong enough to handle your DAW, strong enough to handle the different sounds that you're trying to use. And more importantly, once you have the biggest understanding of the type of music that you wanna make, you need to work from there, work backwards from there. So if you know you're gonna be using big live orchestral sounds, big live horns and drums and guitar plugins and all, a lot of this different stuff that's super taxing. A lot of you all are using ozone. Ozone can be extremely taxing on your computer. If you just understand what you're going to want to use and what you need to get that end result, that polished result that you're looking for and work backwards from there. Again, 16 gigabytes for me is more than enough space. I will be upgrading to 32 gigabytes here soon because I need the power. After we get the RAM situated, the next thing we wanna look at is storage space. Your hard disk drive is gonna be able to, more times than not, it's gonna be cheaper. It's gonna give you more space. You'll find those huge five terabyte, 10 terabyte, 20 terabyte drives and they'll be a lot cheaper. The thing is they're a little bit slower when it comes to recalling instances of plugins and, and, and sound banks like we talked about earlier. The other side for the SSD is that they're gonna be more expensive, but they're gonna be way faster, like way faster in recalling instances. Either or works, but again, for me, I wish that I knew the difference between those two when I was first determining the type of computer that I needed for the music that I wanted to make. I would have went with an SSD all day because it's faster. And then I would have used my HDD as like a backup for all of my music files, which actually brings me directly to that next sort of sub point as far as, you know, memory is concerned, is having a backup hard drive and maybe even two. Here's why. If any of you have ever lost any music, which I know that I have because maybe a computer crapped out on me or I, you know, it broke or, you know, I, you know, forgot to, I overwrote a, a file. You wanna have a backup drive for all of your music. You wanna back up your project files. You wanna back up your, your stems. Once you get done with the project, you wanna, so wanna bounce all that stuff out. Bounce out the MIDI files, bounce out the WAV files, bounce out the MP3s, bounce out the different versions, um, your, alt, your alt mixes. You wanna bounce out you know, the master version of it. You wanna have everything set up and put aside so in the, any instance that you lose any of the files or any of that you lose your computer or you break your computer or whatever happens, it just craps out on you, especially those of you all that are using um, Windows like me, it can crap out on you and you can lose everything. And so you wanna make sure you're having a backup of everything that you're doing. I wish I knew that up front because I would have saved me a lot of heartache and a lot of lost music. The third thing that I wish I knew before I started making music was that 
the difference between a random person, a random producer's drum kit, I don't care if they're well known or not, versus a quality sound. Now sometimes those random producers can have quality sounds. But listen to check this out. Have you ever been in a situation where you bought somebody's drum kit and then you get to the mixing phase and you're wondering why your sounds aren't sounding right? Why you can't get the levels right? Why everything sounds so hot? Why everything, even if you turn the volume down, it still sounds like it's clipping? That's because the people who are making the majority of these packs, the majority of these sounds, they don't know what they're doing. And I'm not, this is not a shot to anybody who makes a drum kit, but it, it's more so the people that are looking to get into music production, you have to understand that mixing is gonna be what most people see, see as the most daunting task for whatever reason. And what I found is that the reason why is because the drum packs and drum kits that you all are getting, the loop packs and loop kits that you're getting from different producers, they're not mixed well out of the gate. So the sounds that you're getting aren't polished. Even if you use a company like Splice, which I love, you can still find some pretty bad quality sounds in Splice. So you wanna be really careful and make sure that you're auditioning these sounds before you buy an entire pack. For me, I cherry pick. I go into different packs and I'll pick out, okay, I like these four sounds. I like these five sounds here. I like these seven sounds here. I might like this entire pack, so I'll get the whole pack. If it's like whooshes or risers or stuff like something like that, which you can't really mess up, you can, but it's, it's rare. Um, that would be my that would be my third thing there is just making sure that you're buying quality drum sounds or quality sounds in general same thing with vsts a lot there's a lot of crap vsts out here like a lot of crap vsts so you want to make sure that when you're buying your vsts that you're auditioning the sounds watch a ton of youtube videos and hear people actually using these sounds and you listen to what some of their reviews are especially if they make the type of music that you make this next one is a little bit controversial and I'm curious what people's response is gonna be from it. Um, it's gonna be soundproofing in isolation versus quality headphones. Check this out. People will tell you that you need to soundproof your room, but if, you, if you've ever done any extensive amount of research into what it takes to soundproof or isolate your room, because there's two different topics there, right? It's extremely expensive and it usually the biggest problem that most people have is from the low end. If you look up in the price of any bass trap, like any quality bass trap, which so those are what you put in the corners of all four corners of your room, that stuff gets truly expensive really, really fast. You have to understand that most of these professional studios that people go to and that are built, all of the dimensions of the room are taken into consideration before any of the gear is purchased. That's including the speakers. That's including any diffusion that needs to take place. That's including, you know, the, the triangulation, the, which is literally like the center point between you and your two speakers, right? All of that is taken into consideration. And so when the people who built your house, built your house and built the room that you currently have your studio in, none of that was taken into consideration. So regardless of the amount of money that you dump into soundproofing, the foam that you put on the walls, none of it really matters because again, it's still not gonna be that perfect level. So all you're doing is you're slowly treating problems in certain areas. My thing is, I'd rather you get a quality pair of headphones. You know, nice, you could get a couple pairs of different headphones. You got your open back and your close back. So that's what I wish that I knew beforehand and I wouldn't have spent half as much money on trying to soundproof a room that was almost unsoundproofable, right? A lot of you might be in those same situations. I have a sub pack, which is right, I'm sitting right on it. That's another uh, alternative that you all can use in order to help you all, you know, feel that low end. And for, so, for those of you that maybe live in, for those of you that might live in apartments or, you know, in areas where you can't really crank up the sub bass like really loudly, I live in a house and I still use a sub pack, even though I have a subwoofer right up under me, right? So it's just one of those things that I really wish that people would take that into consideration instead of trying to pump products on everybody. As a beginner, what I've noticed that these companies do and what a lot of people are traps that people fall into is that if I have this type of gear, then I will, I'll get the sound that I need. If I have this particular plug-in, I'll get the sound I need. When in reality, if you get you a nice pair of headphones, a nice pair of studio monitors, and just go from there, you'll be fine. Now, the one caveat that I'll say here is unless you're recording vocals, 
you might have to find a different solution there. I still don't think soundproofing your room is the way to go because again, you more than likely won't be able to afford it like a true soundproofing. So you might look at like individual isolated sound booths that they do sell. Again, you might build your own, whatever cert, whatever you fall, whatever, whatever you figure out, I'll obviously leave that up to you. But again, for me, that would be one of the bigger, you know, cost saves that I would say you would run into in those type of situations. Get you, get you, get you a good pair of headphones, get you a good pair of monitors. There's plenty of uh, there's plenty of software that it's, there's plenty of software that exists now that you all can use that'll help you kind of simulate the room of a professional mixing studio. I'd recommend that you all take and use those type of things, whether it's SonarWorks, right? Or, you know, any of those type of softwares. I think Waves has a couple of um, Abbey Road. I think it's like an Abbey Road, like room simulator type thing. That stuff works much better than trying to fix a room, which even th that you aren't even professionally trained enough to even fix. Right, so don't think that just because you throw up a bunch of soundproofing foam that you're gonna fix the problem. Because in reality, you're just gonna be tricking your ears into thinking that that it sounds good. Right? Mark my words on this one. This will help your mixes translate much better if you're using other software to help get you there, or if you can afford it, which most people can't, go to an actual studio. There are also like different tools that you can use that'll help show you where your specific room falls short. If you absolutely want to start buying the, the foam and the bass traps and the diffusion, there are different tools that you can use that'll let you know, okay, well my room at this specific hurt level, this is where I have a problem, right? At above this specific hurt level, this is where I have a problem, right? That's what you can do there. Number five, buying high-end gear or VSTs just because somebody on YouTube said do it. Don't do that. Most of the people that are on here selling or talking about different plugins, they're affiliates, which is not a bad thing in, in essence, right? But realize it's almost tantamount to you going to like a mall and you seeing those kiosks in the middle of the mall and they got, hey buddy, come over here and try out this cologne or hey, come look at this new, these cell phone cases or check out this perfume, right? It's literally tantamount to that. So be very cautious for the people that you do listen to when it comes to like different plugins and it comes to, you know, product reviews because nine times out of 10, most of these people are getting paid to sell you the product that they're talking about, right? So make sure you're aware of that before you go in and purchase it. If you listen to somebody and they're overly geeked about this brand new headphones or these, they're overly excited about, oh man, this new VST, this is gonna change the game or buy this mini pack because, oh man, it's just so crazy. I'm telling you, they're getting paid to do that and talk about it and you're gonna get it and you're gonna feel gypped it's not gonna help you. It's not gonna help you in any way, shape, or form become a better producer or composer. All right, people. I hope you found that list helpful. And I, it's, again, this is just my own personal experience. This is just my own personal take for what the things that I wish that I knew before I got started, before I bought a single piece of gear, before I, you know, invested any amount of money into plugins. Because I, out the gate, I would have not bought a lot of different plugins, like a lot of different plugins, whether it's Waves, whether it's Native Instruments, whether it's Omnisphere, whether it's whatever. And I don't even own Omnisphere, right? Next is the again, there's diff, there's so many different plugins that I can honestly say that are not really necessary. Um, now, if you like it, you like it. But again, for me, there's a lot of different tools. There's a lot of different things that I, w I wish that I knew before I got started making music. If you found this video helpful, like and subscribe to the channel. And don't forget to leave a comment. Again, I wanna, if you disagree with what I'm saying, let me know in the comment section below. Some people might be upset, particularly about, don't listen to other YouTubers about buying stuff and the soundproofing. I fully expect to receive feedback on those two items because it's it's sort of a, it's a touchy subject. But again, I wanna be extremely honest with you all about the things that I personally wish that I knew before I jumped into this thing. All right, y'all, peace.